Welcome to this edition of Diligence Inside America's Boardrooms. I'm TK, TK Kerstetter, and I'll be your host for today's show. We're going to be talking about systemic racism, how boards can positively impact their companies and boardrooms. And this is part two of a four-part series that's looking at three prominent, prominent U.S. segments of the population that have been affected both in the company, their companies and in their company's boardrooms. In part two, we'll discuss the Latino and or Latina slash Hispanic corporate community. And joining me to have this um, important discussion is first of all, Esther Aguilera, who's the president and CEO of the Latino Corporate Directors Association. Welcome, Esther. Thank you, glad to be here. And also joining us is Raul uh, Campos, who's a board member with the Regional Management Corp, also sits on the Liquinet, Liquinet Board. He's the LCDA chairman and a former SEC commissioner. So welcome, Raul. Thank you, TK. Great to be here. So this is all about keeping the conversation going and not letting us drift back into the past status quo where we aren't seeing significant change. Obviously, um, we need to see change. Our first part of this series, we, um, I met with the Asian Pacific community. And if anybody hasn't seen that show, I certainly invite you because that sort of set the stage and foundation so for what we're doing in this four-part series. I also want to make everybody aware that we are going to be referring to a, a report that was done um, called Call to Action for Equity and Inclusion in the Boardroom from the Diverse Corporate Directors Coalition of which the Latino Corporate Directors association plays a major role. So this topic of systemic racism is never a very comfortable topic to talk about. Um, but I must tell you guys that I was looking forward to discussing the Latino slash Hispanic community the most, mostly because I'm not sure how it's gotten so passed over um, with respect to inclusion over the years. And the Latino community is the largest ethnic community in the United States. Yes, its percentage of board seats is under the Asia Pacific and uh, significantly under um, the um, Afro-American. And if that's not bad enough, as long as we're setting the stage correctly, um, it's puzzling to me how a diversity sensitive state like California, in which 39% of its population is Latino, Hispanic, of the six, 662 public California companies, uh, 570 of those companies have no Hispanic, um, Latino Hispanic representation. And while I'm on a roll, since the SBA 26, the public company diversity law was put into place in October of 2018, 511 women directors were given board seats and only 17 of those, 17 of the 511 were Latino Hispanic. So with that pretty, um, not so pretty um, introduction, uh, Esther, if any race has, any ethnic race has a reason to be upset about inclusion at both the senior and board level, it's the Latino Hispanic community. As the largest ethnic race in the US, why is this segment often overlooked and undervalued? Well, first, uh, TK, thank you for having us. And 
initiating this very important conversation. Um, as you mentioned in your statistics, in fact, those were the Latino Corporate Directors Association who started to really do the research and surface this data. The LCDA is a fairly new organization. We are made up of Latinos that serve on publicly traded and large private company boards. And it was formed because the number of Latinos on boards is very small. And that number has not only not changed, we, the population keeps growing and the number stays the same. So part of what we're doing is helping to raise awareness. Uh, I don't think people realize and know these numbers, but until we surface them, then we can start a conversation. So we started with um, tracking and identifying Latinos on corporate boards. We released on our website a Latino board tracker just this year. And TK, as you know, uh, tracking the race ethnicity of board directors is not easy. So we set about doing that. And we have uncovered a lot of really, um, really poor showing of Latinos on boards. On the country's 1,000 largest companies as tracked by uh, Fortune, Latinos only hold 3% of the total Fortune 1,000 company board seats. And Latinas are only 1%. And as you mentioned, TK, not only are we nearly 40% of California's population nationwide, we are 60 million and um, nearly 20% of the U.S. population, nearly one in five. So one, if we're not unsurfacing this, you know, what doesn't get measured doesn't get results. And what we found when we did the research in California, as you mentioned, there were, um, we first tracked the number of, of women who were appointed to California companies since the um, gender bill was enacted. And yes, while we need and should have more women on boards, it doesn't necessarily translate, we have not seen uh, women of color, and especially Latinas, brought into the fold. So only 3.3%, as you mentioned, of the 511 women were Latinas. That, you know, is, that's not acceptable. And of all California-based companies, only 13 have a single Latino or Latina on their boards. As that means that 87, 83% are missing out on this incredibly um, experienced talent, um, business leaders, as well as voices that should represent uh, the company's consumer, employees, and, and the base of the U.S. So, you know, it has to be very intentional. I look forward to talking more about different ideas and strategies here, but clearly there's exclusion and Latinos are the least excluded of any major group in the US. Well, everybody says that your board should um, sort of mimic your community or your customers or whatever. So again, I don't, I don't think we have to make a case on why this doesn't make sense. Um, the numbers are just, um, just show a poor effort. Um, so Roel, you are very well traveled in the corporate world. I'm sure you have seen many examples of the systemic racism to la Latino companies and certainly to its people and workers. Yet with the work of the um, LCDA and you guys have done a terrific job recently and some years before you, uh, Hasser was trying to accomplish um, the same thing to bring, bring attention. We just sort of now are starting to hear a voice that says, hey, don't forget the, the 
this talent and skill set pool. So why the seemingly slow start in being heard? And is the Latino Hispanic racism different from the African American or the Asian communities? Well, let's begin uh, with the latter. And, and like Esther, I, I'm very grateful, TK, for your invitation to be here to have this uh, very important discussion. Um, it, um, it, it, you know, our voices need to be heard and in corporate America, as well as mainstream America, needs to understand much more about Latinos than they currently do. Uh, first, uh, our, our group, uh, our large uh, ethnic identity as Latinos, uh, is often overlooked by mainstream America. Why? Uh, we, we, we just don't come to top of mind. And we have not uh, had the advocacy on our behalf that our uh, brothers and sisters on the uh, African-American side have had. And uh, we're, we're, we tend to be overlooked. Um, you know, we, we represent broadly uh, several groups, you know, from Caribbeans, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, to uh, to others uh, from Mexico, and, and and there's been different immigration waves that have come here, and all of this has gotten muddled, I believe, in the mainstream of um, of what's occurred. So, uh, why uh, we we probably need to do a better job of of letting corporate America and letting mainstream America know how important our community is to our country. And, and we say that without arrogance. Uh, in various states, California, as you, as you mentioned earlier, Texas, we're over 40%, you're right about 40% of the population. Uh, there's over $2 trillion spent by Latinos in, um, in, in the economy. So without Latinos in, in the American economy, our GDP would not grow. Uh, it probably would be substantially less. We're ahead of France, you know, in a, in a hierarchy in terms of our, if our particular community were a country by itself. So all of this to say that we matter. We matter, okay? And being ignored, being overlooked, as Esther said, is not acceptable to, um, you know, my community any longer. And so uh, what we need to do is, is point out the, um, you know, you, at best you could call it benign neglect, uh, overseeing, overlooking our community, but that's not ex an excuse that uh, will scour or will be acceptable any longer. Um, we, we intend, you know, as, as a group uh, of diverse communities uh, that are Latino, to point out to corporate America that um, uh, a lot of the consumers, a lot of money that is spent, a lot of their revenues are dependent on Latinos being involved and being part of their, of their uh, sales, you know, sales. Without us, uh, again, substantial revenues can be lost. And um, there is a point when, you know, perhaps things like boycotts, you know, might be necessary. Uh, we don't want to go there initially. You know, we want to uh, see if we can work out things, you know, with uh, boards and with uh, CEOs and corporate suites and, and develop, you know, what we think they want to do, which is to be to have a truly diverse board on their, um, you know, for their companies. And diversity means including Latinos. Now, examples of systemic, uh, systemic uh, racism that, that have affected Latinos. One, uh, Latinos have a hard time accessing capital. Uh, it is, studies have shown that, uh, I may have my figures a little bit off, but you'll get the idea, you know, five or six times more difficult for a Latino to convince angel investors, to convince private equity, to invest in a Latino or Latina run startup business. Very difficult. It's difficult to get uh, funding uh, from banks, you know, for Latinos. Uh, why? Well, uh, you know, there's a discomfort. There, there's a view that perhaps Latinos will not be as good as white 
you know, uh, leaders of, of companies. That is totally wrong, by the way. You know, the, uh, the uh, statistics, and we won't go through them today, show that Latinos uh, have created, uh, you know, thousands, if not millions of jobs in this country, run successful businesses. Latinas are more entrepreneurial than any other group, including males, you know, in the country. So that's not, that, that's not happening. I'll give you another example. You mentioned California. So one of the biggest industries in California today and the fastest growing is the tech world, right? The tech industry. Well, the tech industry has a very closed culture. There's some noise about it improving, but it hasn't yet. So there is this, uh, what I call, or what others have called, I've just taken the name that others have given it, there is a white bro culture. White bro culture. So that excludes women, it excludes minorities, and it certainly excludes Latinos. One thing uh, that I've heard very regularly, and I, I've known people that I've mentored who have tried to get into the large tech companies, is that they get told after being very qualified, having the scientific background, having the technical background, that, well, they're just not a cultural fit. Well, what does that mean? There's not a cultural fit, you know? Uh, you know, this is, that, in other words, they're not white and geeky enough, apparently, for the tech companies. So these are things we're facing in the background, right? Having said this, there's others of goodwill. You know, some of the companies in the tech world in California are, are trying to do better. So I don't mean to, you know, uh, condemn everyone. But anybody, you know, who understands the industry would, would agree that that is part of what's going on. So no capital. Uh, a, a, an inherent bias. If if a Latino, for example, still has a an accent because they grew up speaking Spanish, perhaps that's held against them. They're viewed as not being perhaps as capable or as smart. You know, all of those things are out there that we have to deal with. And again, this is not a a session uh, to whine. You know, uh, I you know I'm explaining to you what has happened and why. Latinos are being excluded. We believe and we know that there are extremely qualified Latinos at every level in every industry, and we're ready to serve on boards, ready to serve in the corporate suites. And there's a huge amount of talent that simply is not being accessed by corporate America. And we intend to make sure that corporate America knows about that talent. And I would simply add, um, Absolutely, as Roel mentioned, their supply is not the issue. In fact, uh, our membership, LCD, is a resource and a source and part of the solution. And our membership represents uh, extremely, among some of the most respected and accomplished leaders in business from every sector and every industry. And we keep growing and identifying both experienced directors, but also board qualified. But one uh, quick note on, on something that is missing, and that is, you know, we Latinos have not, have been written out of the history books. Quite simply, there is, there's been systemic exclusion of Latinos from, you know, the, the beginning while we have contributed and served you know, in the civil wars and in every war to defend this country, um, there is a history uh, that isn't told. Um, Roel's history, he's, he and his family have been here for many generations. There's uh, a history in California and Texas and other places where um, Latino, Hispanics, uh, their properties were taken away. They were taken away by white settlers. Um, that story is not told. Also, you know, when the federal National Labor, Labor Relations Act was put in place in the early 1900s, farm workers and domestic workers were excluded and could not, uh, didn't have an avenue to speak up and appeal unethical work conditions. And third, we know about our, you know, our immigration laws. There is in the, after the Great Depression or during that time, 
there was uh, uh, the Repatriation Act. And this act basically um, tried to send a lot of Latinos back to Mexico, many who were U.S. citizens. And this is important to, to kind of tell your audience because I don't think the history and people don't know this. And I'll just say one example. My family, my grandmother was from uh, Colorado. Uh, her family was in Colorado many generations, a mixture of, of Mexican and Native American and, you know, um, many cultures there in Colorado. Uh, when she married a Mexican, uh, her husband was being deported, even though he's married to a U.S. citizen. And in effect, she was deported as well. So I was born in Mexico and I'm a legacy of some very um, unfair and systemic exclusion and racism against Latinos. So just, I think that uh, we need to tell our story. It is, uh, it is not in the history books, but it's our responsibility to make sure that these, this is part of the conversation. TK, um, th this is a gruesome fact, but Latinos were lynched uh, as late as 19 in the 30s, going into the 40s in California. So, um, you know, uh, th th there has been uh, very overt racism that, uh, uh, th that our, our, our group, our community has had to deal with. So you are correct that I don't think, certainly I wasn't aware, okay, of that. Um, and it's always good to make people understand the past, but now here we are where our goal is to change the status quo. So let's move to the issue of what should boards be doing to change the status the, to change the status quo and promote true change in the organization and in the boardroom, but particularly with the Latino Hispanic community into key managerial positions, which I believe is one of the key stepping stones to getting people into senior management and then subsequently having those opportunities on the board. Not that not that the board shouldn't be reaching back into areas other than senior management, but it's certainly an easy stepping stone. So I know you guys have spent a lot of time on this report to call to action. So I'd like to hear from both of you and Esther, we'll start with you. What should boards be doing today to help change this picture, which is not a pretty picture? Thanks, TK. Well, we, the Latino Corporate Directors Association, came together with um, the other organizations that represent diverse corporate directors. We call ourselves the Diverse Corporate Directors Coalition. Um, it is a coalition that um, LCDA and I helped to found and continue to work with um, all of our counterparts. We launched a comprehensive uh, call to action and real uh, a game plan for companies to have um, clear steps that need to be taken to address um, and be more inclusive. Uh, first and foremost is disclosure. Um, as you know, uh, companies are not required to disclose and are based on self-identification, the composition of their board. So it's very difficult to uh, arise at the numbers and track this and track progress. So as we said earlier on, what gets measured gets results. Um, and we, the plan encourages uh, the disclosure and reporting um, as uh, and what we're gonna start to hear more of, um, and we really encourage companies to be proactive in implementing a lot of these um, policies and practices because uh, institutional investors, the community and others are, are, you're going to be hearing and getting a lot more pressure. So it's not just the Diverse Directors Coalition or LCDA who are calling for this, but here is a roadmap 
for companies who will start to get more pressure. And it's better to be ahead of this. So in addition to disclosure, um, we offer some very uh, practical practices that should go into place. Um, utilize some, uh, something that we're calling an updated Rooney rule. And that is um, that at least 50% of your slate that you're interviewing for a board should be made up of, of uh, diverse candidates, inclusive of Latino, African-American, Asian, and others. Um, the, and if you are on a board that is, has men and women, but is still an all white board, you should interview a slate of 100%. All of the candidates should be, uh, uh, you should consider a full slate of candidates made up of race and ethnic uh, executives. And what we're saying here is just to give us a shot. When you interview and you see the quality and the caliber, you know, it's up to the board to come up with their makeup of the board but give us a shot, have more diversity on your slates, have you know, all diverse slate if you have no race ethnicity. And also just lastly, you know, we need to debias you know, the search criteria too often. And um, at LCDA, we help, to, we help search firms, companies, and private equity and others um, tap into diverse talent, but still we're, getting requests for CEOs, CFOs, COOs. Um, we need to broaden that because there's a lot of talent, especially in the very competitive business environment that we're in now. You have tremendous talent in the C broader C-suite roles and in line uh, leaders who have large P&L responsibilities you know, across the country. So think about a broader subset of talent and first-time directors. Same question, Roel. Well, there's a lot that boards and, and public companies and private companies can do. First of all, you know, as Esther's uh, saying, uh, there has to be, uh, we're using the word intentionality now. You know, you have to intend to have a diverse board. So when I consult, I, I tell boards, look, you need a good diversity policy. Let's start there. And your diversity policy needs to define diversity to include all minorities, uh, in particular, and in including Latinos. And your goal has to be to be representative and to have a diverse uh, board, ultimately. If you make that commitment, then you, know, you will eventually make progress. The second part of that is to also, from the board's perspective, have a diversity policy that applies to the company. As you were saying, TK, uh, you know, senior positions matter, but it also matters to have a pipeline. So uh, the diversity policy should lead to um, compensating and having performance evaluation of senior people you know, in a company based, you know, one factor being based on how well they do to promote diversity in their ranks. Do they have a pipeline? Are they looking, are they interviewing diverse candidates that include Latinos? All of those are things that could happen that can start and jumpstart uh, actually the effort toward diversity because it's a dual situation. We need both diverse boards and we need diverse corporate suites. And, um, you know, as we know, uh, you can't have uh, candidates for boards unless they often have had a, a very robust uh, business career, including being a senior person. So they have to start. And, um, it, and, and this is what a board can do, you know, to encourage and to demand this sort of thing. As, uh, as Esther was saying, one, one part of a diversity policy for a board would be to disclose on the proxy, the makeup, the personal backgrounds of the directors on a voluntary basis, of course. So if they're African-American, you know, that should be disclosed. If they're Latino, Latina, that should be disclosed, you know, along with their skill sets, you know, whether they're in accounting, whether they're former CEOs, all of that as well. 
This is important to investors. Investors are now the ones who are demanding diversity on boards. You know, your CalPERS, your New York Commons, your, uh, you know, State Street and so forth own huge chunks of, uh, of equity in these companies. And they want diversity on the boards, and which include Latinos. And why is that? Because studies show that a diverse board performs better. It delivers a better bottom line. And so investors naturally want the best returns possible. So they want diversity. So this is what, what we're encouraging. And I, in particular, want to measure how many Latinos were interviewed for board vacancies. If Latinos are being interviewed, then that shows uh, goodwill, it seems to me. And you're accomplishing several positive things. You're learning you know, as a board about Latinos, and you're seeing how many qualified individuals there are. And, uh, and that's useful, even if that person is not selected ultimately for the board position. So, so that's very important. So those are things you know, that come to my mind immediately, that a board, through its influence, uh, a board CEO, a board and through the CEO and through their management can make a difference both on the company side and on the board side. And these things can happen very quickly because as Esther said, we have a huge pool of very talented individuals. The other thing is that boards, when they're looking to do a search, right, often hire recruiters, you know, whether it's a corn ferry or diversified services, or you know, anyway, we all know the, the large number of them. It is important that they specifically tell the recruiter that they are interested in interviewing Latinos, as well as African-Americans and women, okay? If you don't tell your recruiter that, uh, they often don't provide a list of candidates that, uh, that has that kind of diversity. So that's, that's an important element as well. So I'll stop here. You know, there's uh, there's, there's more there's more to do, but uh, you know, for now, that's that. Those are the things that are top of mind. Well, we are um, running out of time here. I just wanted to add one point, though. Um, you know, this show has always uh, touted the importance of board leadership, and in this case, um, it's it's almost like board refreshment. If you have board good board leadership, you it takes the pressure off disclosure. It takes the pressure off those things because they're just taking care of situations like this themselves. And if if you if your board, if you're a director sitting out there and your board is not looking at this stuff, you, in my mind, have the obligation to press the issue. And uh, if not, then you have to give some thought of whether you have the right leadership leading leading your board because the board can make a huge difference in what a company does and what a board looks like. So um, Esther, where can people get a copy? What's the website where people can get a copy of this call to action? We invite everyone to go to our website, latinocorporatedirectors.org. And it's a news release. And within the news release is a link to the call to action. We invite everyone to visit and call us if we can be a resource. Well, um, I encourage everybody to do that. It's a good report. Um, and I want to thank uh, Roel and Esther for taking the time. This is a very important discussion. Um, and particularly, I think, with the Latino Hispanic community. So um, hopefully, this will help move things forward. And I want to thank you both for taking the time to join me. Thank you, TK. Thank you. And that will conclude this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week when we take another look at a critical topic that'll help you be a better board member or committee member. So we'll see you then. <music>